All right, so today is going to be the last lecture. We're going to kind of finish up. I miss a lot of details. Okay, so the goal of the class and of what we want to finish up today is this conjecture of Og, which is what Mazur proved. So let me remind you what the statement is. Uh, so I'm going to say it as follows. So let G be a finite group. Then there exists an elliptic curve over the rational numbers uh, with G equal to the full torsion subgroup of E. If and only if uh, G is one of 15 groups. So G is Z mod NZ, where N is between 1 and 10, or N is equal to 12. Or G is Z mod 2Z times Z mod NZ, where n is 2, 4, 6, or 8. Okay? All right, so so far what we've proved is the theorem of Mazur and Mazur Tate. So what these say together is that if n is greater than 7 is in prime, so prime number bigger than 7, the no elliptic curve has n torsion. No e over q has a rational point of order. Okay, so that includes all the primes that you would expect from, from this theorem, but you have to take care of some composite values and some other little things. All right, so <coughs> if we have some elliptic curve over Q, then it's torsion subgroup. We know two things about it. So first of all, just from the structure of torsion over, say, the complex numbers, you know that it's a product of two cyclic groups, and you know that it's finite by the mordell Bay theorem. So you can write it as z mod nz times z mod mz, where n divides n. And now you know that by the they pairing, by the they pairing, n has to be one or two. Right, because, I mean, this group contains z mod nz times z mod nz inside of it. And over any field, if you have the full n torsion in your elliptic curve, then that field has to contain the nth roots of unity by the Vey pairing. Right? And Q only contains the first and second roots of unity. OK, so you're always either cyclic or z mod 2 times cyclic. And when you're z mod 2 times cyclic, you can assume that second cyclic group is even. <coughs> so given given what we have and these simple observations, we have to show the following. We need to exclude n torsion. Or n uh, in the following set. 14, 15, 16, 18, 20, 21, 24, 25. 27, 35, and 49. Right, this is just some little simple combinatorial thing. Just check that these are what you have to exclude. And then we also have to exclude certain z mod 2 times bigger things, right? But all we have to exclude is z mod 2 times z mod 10 and z mod 2 times z mod 12, because once we've done this, we know that you can't get anything bigger than 12 as a torsion order. So, and then that's not completely everything for this theorem I've stated. I mean, this theorem was also has an existence thing in it, right? That for these groups there exists elliptic curves. So we also need to show that uh, there exists. There exist elliptic curves 
with the torsion subgroup, one of these 15 groups. So for each G, we need to construct a little bit. Yeah? Well, once we exclude 5 squared. <laughs> right. Okay, so, so this is what we have to do today, these three things. <coughs> Any questions? <coughs> All right. So the general idea of how to do this is, I mean, you're trying to show that there's no points on x1n. I mean, for, the, for this step, you're trying to show there's no points on x1n except the cusps. So you want to know what all the points on x1n are, basically. So this is some you know, curve. It could have high genus. And like a good strategy for finding the q points on a curve uh, is to find a map down to an elliptic curve. And then, you know, I mean, because you know if you have a map of curves, q points have to map to q points. So if you can find the q points on the target, then you just have to figure out what maps to them. And for elliptic curves, there are good ways of finding what the q points are. It's easier than higher genus curves. In particular, if you can find curves of rank zero, then it's really easy to find the q points from the curve of rank zero. And it so happens that for many of these values, x zero of n has genus one and rank zero. And so in those cases, we get a lot kind of easily. So that's what uh, I want to start off by doing, in those cases where we get this elliptic curve kind of for free. By the way, the, all these kind of small cases were done by Kubert before Mazur's theorem, and he did even more cases than this that are also covered by Mazur. Okay, so here's the proposition. So suppose n is one of the following 12 numbers, 11, 14, 15, 17, 19, 20, 21, 24, 27, 32, 36, 49. Okay, if n is one of these things, then the statement is no elliptic curve has n torsion. So let me explain how the proof of this goes. So for these n, x0 of n has genus 1. And these are exactly the n for which it has genus 1. OK, so by kind of standard methods, uh, you can show that this has rank 0. So it's usually not so hard to show that an elliptic curve has rank zero if it's supposed to have rank zero. So nowadays, I mean, this direction of BSD is known. So you can just compute the L function at one. And once you know that it's non-zero, which you can just do by computing a few decimal places, you know that it has rank zero. You can also do it by descent. So that thing, thing that we did before with the Mazur tate thing, the 13 torsion case, I mean, something like that will work here. And it's even a simpler argument in this situation since it's an elliptic curve instead of a two-dimensional Lang variety. OK, so you show it has rank 0. And now you know that the only points on it are torsion points. And it's really easy to compute the torsion in an elliptic curve. So you compute the torsion points, which is all points. This is easy. You mean all, all the points over extensions of fp for different p's? Well, I mean, that's kind of what the BSD conjecture is about, right? I mean, the L function of the elliptic curve only knows the points over fp of the elliptic curve. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, you can kind of translate it out of the language of L functions if you want, and it says something about the asymptotics of the number of points versus the rank. Well, yeah, I mean, you might be able to make that effective in some way and say that if you know the points up to a million, then that's enough to, it's something in terms of the numerics. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think there's this problem about the convergence of the L function, maybe, right? No, but I mean, it only converges like to three halves in the row. But, I mean, you know it comes from a modular form, and so if you know enough of those coefficients. No. Because there's going to be like, I mean, for any curve over FP, there'll be lots of point curves over Q that reduce to that. Okay, so we compute all the points on this. Okay, so now if you're lucky, if all these points are cusps, then you're done. Right, because any rational point of x1n has to map to a rational point of x0n, and only the cut, I mean, the inverse images of the cusp here are the cusps there. So if the only things here are cusps, and the only things on x1 of nq can be cusps, right? So actually, in Kubert's paper, I mean, he states this, this exact kind of theorem. Well, he doesn't state it as a theorem, he has a sentence that says this. And he says, he says you know, it has rank 0, and then the result is immediate which I don't, really don't understand. It seems like there's more work. I mean, if, if this is true, then you're done. But this actually is not always true. There are x0 ends for, for these ends where you have q points besides the cusps. And then, it, I mean, it seems to me that you have to do more work, right? Because you have to take each one of those curves and actually check that it doesn't have end torsion. And in fact, it's even a little worse than that. So let me, let me just explain what the details are. Okay so, let's, okay, so let's suppose this is not the case. So let x1 up to xn be the non-cusp points. And so each one of these, each xi kind of corresponds to some ei gi, where this guy is an elliptic curve. And this is a subgroup of the right kind. Well, that's not really completely true because this x0n is only a coarse moduli space. Um, but it is true that each one of these points is represented by something like this. Okay? So choose a representative if you want. Okay, so suppose now that you have some point y and y1n of q, which corresponds to some EP. So then the image of y in x0 and s be one of these things. So y maps to xi for some i. And this implies something about e versus ei, right? What does it, what does it say? OK, so I'm saying we have these. Take, take a point y and y1 in of q. So that, I mean, this is a moduli space. I mean, this actually represents the correct moduli problem because it's y1. There's no automorphisms. And so this corresponds to some elliptic curve over q with a point of order n on that elliptic curve. Now this guy maps, this point y maps to some point in y0n. One, and it has to be one of these x's because those are the only rational points. And I'm saying that we've said that these x's correspond to some you know, elliptic curves with g's or whatever. So say y maps to xi, right? y corresponds to this, x corresponds to that. What's the relationship between e and ei? That's right. But if you didn't, then there are only isomorphic over the algebraic closure. They'll have the same j invariant. But since it's only a coarse moduli space, they don't actually have to be isomorphic. So this implies that e and ei are twisted forms. So to prove the proposition, we have to show 
that no twisted form of these EIs has an n-torsion point. So this is actually a statement about infinitely many curves because there's infinitely many twisted forms. But in fact, it's a finite check. So, uh, so okay. So uh, since E i has a since E i admits uh, an n isogeny, cyclic <coughs> n isogeny, we have an exact sequence, and that means its n torsion kind of splits into two pieces. So you can look at the n torsion of E. And this is, I mean, this is a two-dimensional Gal representation over z mod n z, and because you have this cyclic n isogeny, that means it's kind of upper triangular. So you can write it like this: there's some one-dimensional sub on which Galois acts for some character, and some one-dimensional quotient on which Galois acts by some character. So here, the alpha i and the beta i are characters of the Galois group to z mod n z star. And if we suppose for simplicity, let's just say that these EI are not CM, that should be the harder case, then the only twists are quadratic twists, right? And if you look at the, so if EI D is the deep quadratic twist of EI, well, when you do a quadratic twist, I mean, on the tape modules with the n torsion Gal representation, you're just tensoring by the quadratic character corresponding to D. So the n-torsion for this twist kind of has the same decomposition, but where you just throw in this quadratic character. I'll call it chi sub d. And what we want to know is that there's no Galois invariance in this n-torsion, right? That's what it means to have an n-torsion point over q. So you just need to know that this alpha i is not a quadratic character. That's what it amounts to. Or if this extension is split, also that beta i is not a quadratic character. And then the CM case is a little different, but pretty much the same thing. And so just for each i, you just have to compute this character and check that it's not quadratic. That's enough. OK? So that's how the proof of this proposition goes. So let me, uh, I'm going to make a few remarks about this now. So first of all, let me give some examples where you actually have to do this more complicated procedure involving this finite check. So the most interesting case is n equals 21. So in this case, um, on x0 n, there's four cusps, and they're all rational. And it also has four other points that are not cusps. And you can write down exactly what they are. I'll even write the equations for you. four elliptic curves. And I think the way it works is that, well, for some arrangement of them, there are isogenies like this of alternating degrees 7 and 3. So if you do any of the two compositions, you get a rational 21 isogeny. And so these are the only elliptic curves over Q that have a rational isogeny of degree 21. 
And so what you have to do is for each one of these four curves, you have to check that. So these are, these are all non-CM. And so the only twisted forms are quadratic twists, which just means put a D in front, right? And so you have to show that whenever you do that for any one of these four curves, you never have a 21 torsion point. And uh, I mean, you can do it this way. Uh, you can probably also do it another way. Like I checked by hand that if you put D there, you never get a three torsion point even on this curve. So, I mean, it's some very doable finite check. So you also get something uh, when n is 27. Right? So, yeah, 27, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a few cases. Well, anyway, this is a, one that will be important. You'll see in a second. Um, and it has, so x0, n of q, has one non-cuspidal point. And it's given by the equation y squared plus y equals x cubed minus 30x minus 5. And this guy has cm by the square root of minus 27. And so to do the case of 27 torsion, you have to check that this curve doesn't have 27 torsion. Yeah. Uh, ask me at the end. Well, let's come back to that, okay? Because it'll relate to something I'm saying now. I think we'll have time. I can try to actually do it. Okay, so in, in fact, there exists non cuspidal q points on x zero n if and only if so I, I mean this sorry for only, only for the n of genus one if and only if uh, n is in the set um, 11 14 15 17 19 21 27 so these are the only cases where you actually have to do more work but it's a little better than that actually so uh, if n is, so for n 11, 14, or 15, you can actually be a little more intelligent. In this case, uh, x1 then has genus 1. Right, before we were using x0n, but for these three values of n, it's actually x1 in itself has genus 1. Um, and of course, you know, x1 has a finite map to x0n, so it's isogenous to x0n. So, and so since we know that x0n has rank 0, that implies that the same is true for x1. So x1 of n actually has rank 0. And so it's really easy to compute the points on x1n. And so you can just directly compute that they're all cusps. So that's how you can handle these cases. Of course, we've already done 11, 14, 15. So if you combine this observation together with, I mean, what we've previously proved, I mean, this proposition that I wrote down about for you know these 12 values of n, the only case is that you actually need that. So we only really need the proposition uh, for n in the set. 20, 21, 24, 27, and 29. 49 should be. You know, all the other values, were, I mean, like 17 and 19 we'd already handled. You can handle 14 and 15 by this easier method. And so you really only need to use that argument for these values of n. And for these values of n, the only one where you have non-cuspidal q points are these two that I had the examples for, 21 and 27. So really, just these five curves that you have to do something special for. Kubert doesn't say any of this, so it's possible that I'm like missing some obvious argument. But it seems to me like you actually have to do a little more extra work in these two cases. Uh, are there any questions? All right.
So this has taken care of many of the cases. So now we'll uh, handle the Zima 2 times Zima 10 and Zima 2 times Zima 12. They basically follow from what we just did. So the first dilemma. So suppose that we have an elliptic curve over Q and that E of Q contains Z mod 2 times Z mod 2 or Z mod 2 times Z mod 4. The statement then is that there exists uh, an isogeny of degree 2 such that E prime admits a cyclic isogeny Of degree four or eight. All of this defined over Q. All right, so here's the proof. Uh, let P be a point of order two, and let Q be a point of order two or four, an independent point of order two or four. And then you can quotient by these points and get isogenies, cyclic isogenies of degree, whatever the orders are. So let's call those E goes to E1. So this is the map that kills P. And E goes to E2. This kills Q. And so you have the dual isogeny of F. So F dual maps E1 to E. And you can show that the image of the two torsion of E1 contains the point P under this dual isogeny. And so now I want to consider the composition, where I do F dual and then G, so that goes from E1 to E2. So the image of the two torsion of E1 in E contains P, and that's not killed under the isogeny G from E to E2, because that only kills Q. So not all the two torsion here is killed. And since it's of order 4 or 8, that means that it has to be cyclic. So um, E prime is E1. So this is a 2 isogeny from E, and it has the cyclic isogeny of the right size. Okay. So now we can prove if I have an elliptic curve over Q, it does not contain Z mod 2 times Z mod 10 or Z mod 2 times Z mod 12. The proof, all right, well, think of this as Z mod 2 times Z mod 2 times Z mod 5, and this is Z mod 2 times Z mod 2 times, or Z mod 2 times Z mod 4 times Z mod 3. And then we're going to use that lemma. So there exists a two isogeny such that E prime admits a cyclic isogeny of degree four or eight. And then you can combine that with the extra point you have. I mean, here E prime will have a point of order five, and here it'll have a point of order three. So actually it'll admit a cyclic isogeny of degree 20 or 24, right? And so that means that E prime with this isogeny will define a Q point on X0 of 20 or X0 of 24. And these fit into the cases that we just handled. And uh, so there were only finite many Q points here, and these were actually in the cases where there were only cuspidal points. And so that's a contradiction. So what's left in terms of what we need to exclude? Well, 
Well, we just need to exclude torsion orders, 16, 18, 25, 35. Than everything else. So I'm just going to make a few comments on these cases, not really say anything in depth. So for 16 torsion, so this was done uh, by someone named Lind in 1940, so it's much earlier than all this other work. Um, Kubert says it's easy. When I was preparing, I wasn't able to re-derive the argument. And the only reference seems to be this guy's thesis, which is from Sweden in 1940. I can't find this written down anywhere else. OK? But it's easy. So you can do it as homework, I guess. Uh, so for 18 torsion, oh, I guess I'll say that uh, the curve x116 has genus 2. It's a hyperloop curve. And x016 has genus 0. So you can't do this, this game where you map to an elliptic curve. There's no elliptic curve here. But I mean, I think that's the wrong approach anyway. It sounds like it's much more elementary and direct. OK, for 18 torsion, it's the same kind of thing. So the genus of x018 is 0, and the genus of x118 is 2. So again, there's no elliptic curve you can map to. Um, and this is like the 13 torsion case that we did, the maser tate argument, right? It was the same numerics there. And so the, Kubert uh, handles this 18 torsion case in his paper, and he uses just a, the, the same maser tate argument. It's all very similar. Uh, So it shows that if you look at J118 of Q, that the torsion subgroup here is Z mod 21Z, and it meets X118 only at the cusps. So just like in the major Tate setup, it means that it's enough to show that J118 has rank 0. And then he does that by the same kind of descent thing. So, uh, this element that you, we would call gamma 5 before. So this is the element 5 in Z mod 18 star. This acts as an automorphism on X118. And it satisfies the equation gamma 2 squared plus gamma 2 plus 1 equals 0 as an endomorphism of J118. And so that means that the ring that that polynomial defines sits inside the endomorphism ring of J118. And in that ring, seven factors as pi times pi prime, just like in what we were doing in the 13 torsion case. And you, you do this like pi descent again. So you show that multiplication by pi induces a subjection on the Mordov A group, which shows that it has to be finite. Yeah, because it doesn't, X116 doesn't map to an elliptic curve. Um, well, a way that you can know <laughs> is that, uh, I mean, if it did, then that elliptic curve would have to have like conductor 16, or maybe dividing 16. And so it would have to appear as a factor of X016 by the modularity conjecture. And so I don't know, there's probably a better way to say it. I mean, like in the 13 torsion case, we, it was very elementary to prove, right? Very simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you can. It's a hyperlytic curve. It's y squared equals some quartic. Yes, you can. Uh, so actually, uh, Kubert uses equations in one of these cases that I'm about to talk about. Um, so for 25 torsion, Uh, it's a similar thing. It's like a maser tate type argument. Uh, it's a little more complicated, though. So the genus of x125 is 12. The genus of x025 is 0. So again, by the same reasoning, there's no elliptic curve that x125 maps to. Uh, and you know, it's Jacobian is kind of huge. It's 12-dimensional. 
And so the idea is to first cut this down a little. Uh, so if you, well, by, by using the, you know, the automorphisms you have, you make some quotient. So Cooper uses a quotient curve of genus 4 and then applies the maser tate type argument in that setup. And then 35 torsion is a little different. So uh, the genus of X135 is um, big. I didn't write it down. I think it's in like, I think it's 25 maybe. Something big. X035, the genus is 3. Right, so the problem we had before was that X035 had genus 0, but here it's a little big. Uh, and so. You can, there's a nice quotient of this to use. So if you take x0, 35, so remember we talked about this atkin lenner involution. So when we talked about it, it was just when we were looking at x0, n with n prime. You just kind of quotient by the group you have and take the image of the full n torsion. When you have composite level, you can do atkin lenner for each factor. And so here we want to consider the atkin lenner involution at 5, right? And uh, so that's some involution of this curve, and you can make the quotient of the curve by that involution. And this turns out to be a genus 1 curve. And so now you're in this uh, a nice situation again. So you show that this thing has uh, rank 0, and you compute its torsion, and you find, I mean, you show that the only torsion points come from the cusps here. So you show that all the pre-images of Torsion points are cusps. So this shows a little more. It actually shows that x035 has no q points, not just that x135. And the, I mean, the way that Kubert does this is like he actually uses a lot of equations here. I mean, he writes down an equation for x035. I think it's hyperliptic. It's, like y squared equals some quadratic times some quartic. And then he writes down in coordinates what this involution is and figures out what the quotient is and writes down an equation for it. There's actually a lot of, a lot of details to that. It's very explicit. All right, so that, I mean, this is like a sketch of how the flaw argument goes. This handles all the cases. OK? Any questions? No, no, and in, in fact, as far as I understand it, in any genus bigger than one, there's no algorithm to, to, to find the rational points. I mean, conjecture there's a genus one that relies on the finiteness of tate shaft um, But I mean, there are methods that tend to work in practice, but I think nothing that's guaranteed to work. <coughs> All right, so now I want to, We've excluded everything we have to exclude. Now I want to explain why those 15 groups actually do occur. So let's uh, start with the cyclic groups. So suppose n is between 4 and 10, or n is equal to 12. So in this case, uh, x1 of n has genus 0. And in fact, these are the only cases, well, also when n is 1, 2, or 3. But these are the only cases. <coughs> Those are exactly the ones allowed by Maser's theory, right? By the way, I, I mean, I, I've been throwing around all these results about the genus genera of these various curves. You can compute that. I mean, I explained how to compute those. Just use the genus formula. It's a straightforward thing to do. OK, so these guys have genus 0, and they have a Q point. <coughs> you can use the cusps to write down an obvious Q point on these curves. And so that implies that they're isomorphic as curves over Q to P1.
which implies that x1 of n of q is infinite. And in particular, that means that y1 of n of q is not empty. It's also infinite. And when n is at least 4, this y1 of n represents the moduli problem you wanted to. And so this actually tells you that you have both the curves with entropy. So when n is 2 or 3, um, it's still true that this has gene is 0, and, and so this set is infinite. But in those cases, it doesn't represent the correct moduli problem. It's only a coarse space, but it's very easy to write down elliptic curves that have 2 or 3 torsion. Uh, so I mean, you know how to do 2 torsion. So for 2 torsion, if you write down y squared equals f of x, and f of, say, a equals 0, ray is in q, and the point 0a is a 2 torsion. So you can just write down any polynomial that has a q root, and that gives you a curve of 2 torsion. And for 3 torsion, we actually talked about this when we were talking about how to write down equations for y of 3. Um, if you write down any equation of the form y squared plus axy plus by equals x cubed, then the point 0, 0 is 3 torsion. Right? Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. Right. So this just right. This just shows that there exists elliptic curves that have n torsion, not necessarily that there exists an elliptic curve whose full torsion subgroup is z mod n z. Right. And it's the same kind of reasoning in the other cases. So if n is in 4, 6, or 8, you can consider the moduli problem y of elliptic curves is with an injection of z mod 2 times z mod n into e. And that's some nice moduli space. And there's some compact version. And in these cases, x has gene 0 and a Q point from the cusps. And so that implies that, same way, that Y has Q points, and so there exists an elliptic curve over Q, such that E of Q contains Z mod 2 times Z mod N. And of course, when N is 2, it's very easy to get Z mod 2 times Z mod 2. Do Y squared equals F of X, where all the roots of F are rational. OK? So that shows that we can get everything as a subgroup. So now why can you get things as the actual group, the full group? So let me just kind of explain the idea in one case. Let's try to do z mod 5z. So Okay, so we know that z mod 5z occurs inside the torsion subgroup of some elliptic curve. So what can go wrong? I mean, why, how could this fail? Well, it could fail because the torsion could be bigger, right? So the, and there's only one way that it can be bigger, because we've classified what the possibilities are. It can only be z mod 10 if it's bigger. So the only problem is if every e such that E contains Z mod 5, E of Q contains Z mod 5. Every elliptic curve E such that E of Q also <coughs> contains Z mod 10. Right, that's the only problem. So what this, I mean, another way to say this is if you look at the map from Y1, 10 to Y1, 5, Right? This, this is saying that it, you know, you, there's only a problem that this map is surjective on Q points, right? Every point with something order 5 also has something order 2. So we just want this map to not be surjective on Q points. 
Well, each one of these is P1. Meanwhile, an open subset of P1. And this map is um, degree 3. And it's just some easy thing. I mean, if you have a map P1 that's a degree bigger than 1, it's not going to induce this rejection on Q points. It's going to miss most of them. Right? You should think about like x cubed. If it's a degree 3 map, it's going to hit almost no Q points. And so this is not going to be subjective on Q points. Okay. The other cases are a little more complicated because you have to exclude all the bigger groups, but it's not that bad. All right, so that finishes everything. Any questions? All right, so you want to try to do this thing that you asked about? All right, so let me see if we can do that. Yeah, so it actually turns out to not be that bad, though. Oh, so one remark that I wanted to make that's actually related to what I was going to say about this is that these cases, so I mean, the key point for constructing these subgroups was that these things were genus zero. And you can actually write down what the universal families are very explicitly. So for example, uh, the universal curve over y1 of 4 is um, y squared plus xy minus ty equals x cubed minus tx squared. So here t is a parameter on y1 of 4. y1 of 4 is like p1. t is the parameter on that thing. And this is, I mean, for every t in whatever field, except for a few values of t with a discriminant 0, this defines an elliptic curve. And the point 0, 0 is the four torsion point. And for each one of these 15 groups that we're talking about, or at least maybe the ones where the moduli problem is actually a scheme, you can explicitly write down the equation. It's just some polynomials in T and the coefficients. OK? All right, so well, anyway, the way that I worked this out in that one case, so we had some curve like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And we want to show that no matter what d you put there, you don't have three torsion. That's what we wanted to do. Right? And so you can write down the universal elliptic curve with three torsion. So there's a, a little catch because y1 of 3 is not a scheme, it's a coarse space, but there's only one point that has automorphisms. It's the thing that has cm by like z adjoined root 9 minus 3. And that doesn't really matter because it's not cm. So the universal elliptic curve with three torsion Uh, I mean, you can write it down and make a change of variables, and it's going to have the form y squared equals x cubed plus f of t, x plus g of t. And in fact, in this case, f is a linear polynomial and g is a quadratic polynomial. It's I mean, some very explicit thing. And so, I mean, if this curve here had a three torsion point, then it'd be isomorphic to some member of this family, right? And so we can make a change of variables to get rid of the d. So if I change y to 1 over d squared y, that puts a d cubed here, right? And if I change x to 1 over d, dx, that's going to put a d cubed here and a d. And then I can multiply through, and this turns into y squared is x cubed plus d squared ax plus d cubed b, right? And so the question is, I mean, a and b are fixed, and we're allowing d to vary. And the question is, does this curve ever appear in that family? And we know something about when two curves forms like this are isomorphic, right? We know what the only change of variables are. You're allowed to change this thing by a fourth power and this thing by the same sixth power. So the question is, does there exist, let's say, u and t and q, such that d squared a is u to the fourth <coughs> f of t, and d cubed b is u to the sixth g of t, right? And so, I mean, Things work out nicely. So if I square this and cube this and divide, the d's cancel and the u's cancel, and you get that a cubed over b squared has to be f of t cubed over g of t squared. And I mean, if you move g of t over, this is like some degree 4 polynomial in t. And it just turns out that for the curves that we wrote down, it doesn't have any roots in t. So it doesn't live in that family. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Which thing? Those elliptic curves? 
Yeah, so I think you can, there's probably a more clever argument. So I, I believe that in each one of these cases where we have these x0 n curves, that, I mean, even the q, tor q points that um, weren't cusps, I think the cusps generate the torsion group. And the x0 n is like, you know, like a nice thing over z join 1 over n, and the cusps are z 1 over n points. So all those curves, I think, are, have good reduction away from n. So in, in that case that we were dealing with, which was like 21, I think they'll have like good reduction away from 3 and 7, maybe 2 also. But yeah, so you might be able to do something more clever because you know more about these curves. Anything else? Well, so Mazur, you know, generalized his argument and uh, did something about rational isogenies. Um, so these x0 ends, you know, I said that they could have q points besides the cusps. We saw these few cases. And Mazur proved that at least when n is prime, that never happens if n is bigger than 163. Um, so I mean, whenever n is prime and the class number is, you know, the imaginary quadratic field is 1, there's a way that you can write down some isogeny. And that's but once you're past that, you don't have any obvious things in major sort, but there's not enough. Anyway, in the course of that paper, he gave a, a proof that is, I, I think it's a little easier um, of this theorem. But I mean, it still relies on the fact that the, this Eisenstein quotient has rank zero. So it still goes through that. But it just, the other steps are a little easier, I think. But uh, yeah, other than that, I don't think there's any other proof. Anything else?